FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's October 17th, 2017. Well, real estate, what is happening there? And we've got our good friend on, Jason Hartman, whom we haven't had on in quite some time. Jason, welcome back. Hey, Kerry. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I hope uh, investing is going happily for everybody. And um, there's there's a, a limited supply of assets. And you know what's interesting is uh, we have been experiencing such an in uh, an inventory shortage of good properties. You know, if you want to if you want to offer junky properties to your clients, you can find them all day long. But we're we're picky, right? And so we want to offer good quality stuff. And um, the interesting thing about this is that way back in 2000. And four, uh, and uh, you know, up until well, for a few years after that, I used to always share in my seminars with real estate investors an article with Jeremy Siegel and the infamous or famous, depending on which way you look at it, Michael Milton, right? And, um, or Milliken. And um, uh, they were talking about how they were predicting what they called, quote, a looming asset shortage. Okay, and um, Jeremy Siegel especially was talking about this, how with growing prosperity through globalization that's lifted over 300 million people out of poverty uh, over the last couple of decades and the uh, rising tide of the middle class around the world, that there is going to be an asset shortage. And of course, the po- just population in general is increasing. And um, I heard an interview with Ray Kurzweil recently. Uh, you know, he's, he's the futurist and inventor and uh, uh, singularity guy that's thinks, you know, we're, our life is going to be massively extended in the very near future. With all of this going on, Carrie, it begs the question, where are the assets for all of these people to buy? And, and you know, it's an interesting, most people don't think of this. Most investors never think about this question. And, you know, if I hadn't read that, read that article, you know, back in 2004 or so, I probably wouldn't have thought about it either. But there there is a looming asset shortage and I, I guess I'm feeling it too. And if you look at the prices of virtually every asset in the world over the past couple of years, especially since the Trump election. I mean, does it feel like there's a shortage? It sure does to me. Yeah, well, these shortages usually are indications of market peaks, aren't they? Market tops. Maybe. That's that's a valid argument for sure. And they at least they have been in the past. You know, one minute uh, you can't find a house, all right? And the next minute you have the mortgage crisis, the foreclosure crisis. And these real estate busts have happened over and over throughout the years. I mean, in Florida, I think there's been 17 of them since they started building here. So isn't it really an indication that we're probably at the peak of the market and that well, uh, something the, needs to happen? Uh, valid question for sure. But it's a, that question needs to be smoked out intensely. And this is the problem with people... And I know your your listeners say stuff like that to you, right? Oh, so here's the problem. Here, here's the problem is that, you know, how do you know where we are in that cycle exactly? You can say, OK, well, it feels like the market is frothy. But the question you never ask is how much more frothy can it go? You know, maybe yeah, we're just at the beginning of that cycle of peak or topping out. You know, um, we don't know. You know, it, it could it could be three to five more years before we hit this alleged peak. But if if the population is increasing and prosperity is increasing and, you know, that's really never happened before. Oh, what I was going to say about Ray Kurzweil is that um, he said that over the last hundred years, average or median income, I can't remember which it was, um, has increased 11 fold in constant dollars over the past hundred years. Now, of course, you and I and most of your listeners are going to say, well, that's only because that's the official index, the, you know, the government quoted stats on CPI, et cetera. And I'm not going to disagree with that for a minute. OK, because, you know, I agree with that, too. But it's still a benchmark. Right. And so people are overall richer than they used to be. It's 
hard to deny that. Now, the the question you need to ask is, you know, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So, you know, how much richer could they be if we didn't have bad monetary and fiscal policy? Well, that's a very valid question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, that concept of you can't hear the dogs that don't bark is is just missing in so many parts of society everywhere you look. And that comes from a Sherlock Holmes episode called Silver Blaze, where the way Sherlock Holmes very intelligently uh, figured out who committed the murder was because the dog didn't bark. Right. And so the dog knew the person. Exactly. And 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 see, it's sometimes the absence of something that is the most important thing, the profound impact of the thing that didn't happen. Okay. And uh and you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So, you know, you're you and your listeners will probably like this one, right? So a lot of people think liberals are out of their mind, which I wouldn't disagree. Um, you know, uh, left wing policies, left wing policies are pretty much bankrupt. OK, uh, you know, they, they they don't work. OK, now, you know, I do agree with a lot of the social issues just because I'm a libertarian. I don't think the government should be governing much of anything. You know, I just think we should all be free. And as long as we don't hurt anybody else, you know, do what you want. I don't care. Right. OK, so that's the libertarian idea, which is a different part of the spectrum from right and left. It's a different concept. It has the best of all worlds, if you ask me. But, um, you know, the, the, when you argue about minimum wage or you argue about uh, uh, unemployment or you argue about, you know, government program and government spending and Keynesian ideas versus versus Hayek ideas, right? Um, you know, you got to ask yourself the question. You can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So let's take the Great Recession, for example. OK. And, you know, liberals will argue, well, we need more regulation. And yeah. conservatives will say, well, I don't know if we need more regulation or not. They'll sort of some will say yes, some will say no. But the you can't hear the dogs that don't bark because the real question is maybe we had too much regulation and regulation created the environment to have all of those problems because certainly the regulations created giant semi monopolies of big entrenched players that were what was the saying we heard too big to fail right and that's why nobody goes into business there's no startup that comes along and competes with goldman sachs or jp morgan or to look at some of the you know the other companies lehman brothers right you know why isn't there any competition in that world because there's so much regulation that regulation keeps the monopolies for the entrenched players and the left will say well we need more regulations to prevent this from happening again it never would have happened if yeah, right. you know Bernie Sanders and Barney Frank regulated things more and Obama regulated things more, right? That's not the answer. The answer is if we had less regulation, there'd be a lot more players and the the power would be more evenly dispersed in a free market. Mm -hmm. The regulation created the environment to have those problems in the first place, but no one ever sees that because you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. Yeah, of course. Well, we do know that uh, these entities, these too big to fails are created by government policies and since since the uh, crash of 07 08 09 those banks have only gotten larger their power has only increased further and uh, that's after Dodd Frank which was supposed to get rid of too big to fail banks and yet where do we find ourselves the uh, the five major banks are, are probably twice as uh, large as they were and more intertwined into the economy as well. Look, the five major banks, all of the uh, mortgages that get issued and securitized, most of the so-called investors are the banks. They are buying those securities up on the secondary market. Actually, they're buying them up on the primary. A mortgage bank will make a, make a mortgage, you know, they'll complete a loan, and then they take that paper and J.P. Morgan Chase buys it for X amount, X basis points over uh, what they're, uh, what it's yielding, you know, there's they a, are, they yeah. are scamming the system totally. by arbitrage and, and it's guaranteed. <laughs> they, they are screwing us all. I yeah. mean, it's just, uh, it's just unbelievable. If we had less regulation and the cost of entry, if the barrier to entry was lower, there would be more choices and more people would have opportunities and more small entrepreneurs would become wealthy and they would employ more people at higher 
rates of pay and no one ever asked about the profound yeah. impact of things that didn't occur. Yeah. You know, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. This is one of the most important principles in life, in any area of life, in your relationship, mm -hmm. in your physical fitness level, in in everything. You can't hear the dogs that don't bark, but especially true in the economy for sure. Oh, yeah. So well, very good points. If you look at uh, post-depression, post-Great Depression, post-World War II economy, up until 2008, we never had any recessions, the equal of the panics that occurred prior to the Great Depression, leading up to the Great Depression, like the Panic of 1893, the Panic of 1907. We never had them because of these crazy government policies, but it's just like a forest when you don't cut away the brush, when you just let all the dead wood accumulate, all of a sudden one little spark or a bolt of lightning can burn down a million acres. And that's what we had happen in in 07, 08, 09. Uh, one little spark, you know, subprime mortgages weren't that big a piece of the entire pie, and yet they almost brought the system down. Yeah, yeah, because no one was incentivized to put the brakes on anything back then. And I will, I will say, you know, regulation or not, um, the banks have been a lot more careful. So I don't think we could have that type of crisis again. We could have another one because the financial crisis, the Great Recession that we had, and it's so important to learn from history and look at history, obviously, you know, there were really two components to that. And Carrie, I'd be interesting to hear if you agree with this, by the way, but my analysis is, um, that back in 2003, 2004, I was predicting a crash based on liberal mortgage lending policies mm -hmm. and an overinflated market and the three uh, the three one arms and the five one arms oh, yeah. that were being issued adjustable rate loans. You could see the dates that those were the, the big piece of those was coming through the pipeline where those loans would adjust and people would get payment shock. And you knew a lot of those people would just default and walk away. Right. That was easy to predict. The thing I didn't know was part two of the financial crisis. I didn't know the games Wall Street was playing behind the scenes. That's more big short kind of stuff. Michael Lewis, you know, the movie, the book, um, you know, I didn't know I didn't know the same loan was being bundled up into a pool and sold in 33 different pools. I didn't know that there was all this fraud oh, yeah. and there were these fake non-existent ghost loans in these pools mm -hmm. that the Wall Street crooks were reselling to each other and reselling to Iceland and so on and so forth. That I did not know. Um, but I, I knew that from what I could see that the, the lending policies were way too liberal and I knew there would be a crash. I predicted that over and over again yeah. in my live seminars. I used to get in vociferous arguments with <laughs> realtors in Newport yeah. Beach and Irvine that Can't would happen. hate my guts because they, you know, I was basically telling people not to buy. Uh, and yeah, um, that'll and never I was happen, right. Jason. You're just a pessimist. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, well, exactly. I felt in 2006, I sensed the crash coming or 2007 because I was in Las Vegas and on the top of every taxi, I've told this story many a time, was a sign that said, uh, three bedroom, two bath, brand new townhouse, no money down, interest only mortgage, $693 per month. And I remember that number like it was just yesterday. And I, my partners, one was on each side and I said, the real estate boom is over. We're going to have a huge bust now. There's no question about it. But yeah, like what you said about the financial system, the financial alchemy of taking these worthless debt instruments, these mortgages, or they were worth something, but not a whole heck of a lot. And then going and selling and trading and all that, I had no idea. When I found out that's what how Wall Street was making most of its money on mortgage-backed securities, I was shocked. I said, I thought these guys were geniuses. They're just idiots because this thing had to bust. There is no other way. But now... Now we have to look to the future, Jason, and what do we do? What do we do with our money? How do we invest? What what do we do from uh, from going down the drain or getting yeah. flushed down Wall Street's drain? drain? Well, well, great question. You know, of course, you know me. I'm always a fan of a certain type of income producing real estate, and that means linear conservative market 
type of properties that don't have the big ups and downs. They produce good cash flow. Cash flow is very reliable. Appreciation is not. Um, I've just become very conservative at my old age. I'm not old yet, but uh, I'm just saying that because it sounds, it's like the slogan, it's the cliche. And, um, uh, you know, I I just think you really got to be investing for income uh, in in very linear markets, the markets that don't get in the news, they don't make the news, places like Indianapolis, places like Little Rock, Arkansas, um, you know, these types of markets, very conservative, linear, um, they produce good income, that's where you want to be. Um, I'll speak to just a couple other quick points, uh, and you'll probably disagree with me on, on this one. Uh, of course, we have all of the cryptocurrency stuff that feels like the tulip mania oh, yeah. uh, back in Holland. Totally. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, folks, I, I think a lot of people are going to get just wildly burned in, you know, Bitcoin and related things. And what I've always said is I would love nothing more to, than to be wrong about this because I would love to have an alternative currency. But as the old saying goes, Kerry, never bet against the Fed. The, the government's and the central banks around the world are the most powerful forces the human race has ever known. They have standing armies and they have the rule of law on their side. And as soon as, you know, you compete with them with a cryptocurrency, which is, yeah, I know it's decentralized. They can't stop it. Oh, want to bet? <laughs> I don't I wouldn't bet on that. Yeah, they'll criminalize um, it. They'll criminalize yeah. it. The world will. Yeah. You know, they they. They can't stop the drug trade. They can't stop us from trading in, you know, drugs as our currency. We could, you know, people could certainly buy and sell things using cocaine as the currency. But guess what? It's illegal. And you're probably going to eventually get caught and spend time in prison. And that's no fun. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, they'll just criminalize it. And they'll do it under the guise of consumer protection because they'll maybe engineer or maybe just observe, uh, you know, they'll engineer a false flag uh, where there's some big scam or ripoff or one will just happen naturally. And they'll say, oh, you know, we got to step in. The government's got to protect people from this stuff. And, uh, you know, we're going to outlaw all your Bitcoin wallets and take all the money out of them and you're going to pay tax on them and, uh, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So it's uh, something will happen. But I do think the technology holds promise for so many things, uh, restoring integrity to various markets where it has long since uh, been banished. Absolutely. You are right about that. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. But blockchain is not Bitcoin. That's the thing people. No, I know. I know you know that, but I want to make the point to your listeners because a lot of people are confusing these things. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're confusing the technology with the currency. Oh, yeah. It, that would be like saying, well, you know, the technology they use to print dollars is such a good technology that I'm going to put all my stock in dollars. And you know what's going to happen. You're going to get taxed and inflated out of your wealth, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. You can you can be a proponent of blockchain technology and smart transactions, okay, which is what the blockchain allows through escrowing and all kinds of yeah. cool features, right? I mean, just look at like Ethereum uh, and, you know, there and there's a bunch of others, right? And there's all these cool technologies, but that's not the currency, okay? Yeah. The map is not the territory, as the yeah. old saying goes. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I see a lot of, a lot of volatility, a lot of ups and downs, but, uh, but, uh, some type of alternative currency uh, is a great thing, and if it can be maintained. But right now, seeing it go on a speculative boom is not really good for the long-term future of cryptocurrencies. It's actually quite destructive in the long run because it's a parabolic uh, exponential rise. And, you know, when they go up like that, they go down like that. You, you know, tomorrow... Tomorrow, someone can come along and create a new coin to compete with Bitcoin. There's you talk about fiat currency. Yeah. Crypto is the ultimate fiat currency. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it has nothing behind it. I it has came just up with it. 
I already... it, it has just sentiment. It has nothing <laughs> else there. Gold yeah. and precious metals are are strictly sentiment, as Porter Stansberry says, right? Mm. Um, and 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 that's why it trades, okay? Yeah. And what it trades at. And yeah. so so the the cryptocurrency has no intrinsic value. Yeah, I know the supply is limited, but there can be a new supply with another brand name on it okay. with a better technology tomorrow. So there's no limit. Well, I already came okay. up with it. Uh, yeah. The replacement for Bitcoin, it's called Tulip Coin, and it's backed by tulips, tulip bulbs held in a vault in the Netherlands because I want to make <laughs> the Netherlands great again. I want to make yeah. Holland great again. Yeah, you make know? Holland great again. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 you know what? Let's do Tulip Coin now, and then we'll do Lutz Coin and Hartman Coin, yeah, hey. okay? Can, yeah, and maybe we can nice do a coin after it. my dog. I think Coco Coin I sounds like Coco, really good. I like Coco <laughs> Coins better. Let's skip ours. We'll do Tulip <laughs> Coin and then Coco Coin. We'll okay. have our picture yeah. on it. It's perfect. Sounds good. So there anyway, go. I know you yeah. got to run. Just tell us uh, best place to find what you're doing these days. So just my name, jasonhartman.com, J-A-S-O-N-H-A-R-T-M-A-N.com. And I will just uh, quickly, if I can mention to your listeners, sure. we have our next event is coming up in January. It's our big annual event. People wait for it all year. As soon as it's uh, over with the prior year, people want to buy tickets a year in advance. And it's called Meet the Masters of Income Property. Uh, this year, our speakers so far are slated with Danielle DiMartino Booth. I believe you've had her on the show. Yes. Um, she was an advisor to the Federal Reserve uh, Bank, and she's fascinating because she's not a Fed fan, which mm -hmm. is interesting because she's a rogue, and, yeah. uh, and I, I just she's love her. Rogue. Uh, and she's going to be speaking, and John Burns of John Burns Real Estate Consulting is speaking. Uh, we've got Andrew Zatlin. You've interviewed him, the Moneyball sure. Economist. Um, and, of course, Jason Hartman, myself, uh, yours right. truly, and a bunch of other great speakers. So that's a three-day event. It's in January in La Jolla, California. If you live in, in, in the uh, northern climates and it's cold, hey, what a great time yeah. to get out of Dodge in January. Come to beautiful Southern California, go to Legoland, SeaWorld. Disneyland, yeah. uh, you know, uh, enjoy our, our event, meet the masters, go to jasonhartman.com, click on events and check that out. We've got early bird ticket price and carry. And, um, that's what I'm up to. All right. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Maybe we'll just see you there. Wouldn't want to miss Legoland. All right, Jason, thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you again real soon. Happy investing to you and your listeners, Carrie. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Different concept. It has the best of all worlds, if you ask me. But, um, you know, the, the, when you argue about minimum wage or you argue about... Uh, uh, unemployment or you argue about, you know, government program and government spending and Keynesian ideas versus versus Hayek ideas. Right. Um, you know, you got to ask yourself the question. You can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So let's take the Great Recession, for example. OK. And, you know, liberals will argue, well, we need more regulation. And conservatives will say, well, I don't know if we need more regulation or not. They'll sort of some will say yes, some will say no. But the you can't hear the dogs that don't bark because the real question is maybe we had too much regulation and regulation created the environment to have all of those problems because certainly the regulations created giant semi-monopolies of big entrenched players that were what was the saying we heard too big to fail right mm -hmm. and that's why nobody goes into business there's no startup that comes along and competes with goldman sachs or jp morgan or to look at some of the you know, the other companies, Lehman Brothers, right? You know, why isn't there any competition in that world? Because there's so much regulation that regulation keeps the monopolies for the entrenched players. And the left will say, well, we need more regulations to prevent this from happening again. It never would have happened if, yeah, right. you know, Bernie Sanders and Barney Frank. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.
Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's October 17th, 2017. Well, real estate, what is happening there? And we've got our good friend on, Jason Hartman, whom we haven't had on in quite some time. Jason, welcome back. Hey, Kerry. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I hope uh, investing is going happily for everybody. And um, there's there's a, a limited supply of assets. And you know what's interesting is uh, we have been experiencing such an in uh, an inventory shortage of good properties. You know, if you want to if you want to offer junky properties to your clients, you can find them all day long. But we're we're picky. Right. And so we want to offer good quality stuff. And um, the interesting thing about this is that way back in 2000, and four. Uh, and, uh, you know, up until, well, for a few years after that, I used to always share in my seminars with real estate investors an article with Jeremy Siegel and the infamous or famous, depending on which way you look at it, Michael Milton, right? And, um, or Milliken. And um, uh, they were talking about how they were predicting what they called, quote, a looming asset shortage, Okay. And um, it's still a benchmark, right? And so people are overall richer than they used to be. It's hard to deny that. Now, the, the question you need to ask is, you know, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So, you know, how much richer could they be if we didn't have bad monetary and fiscal policy? Well, that's a very valid question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, that concept of you can't hear the dogs that don't bark is is just missing in so many parts of society everywhere you look. And that comes from a Sherlock Holmes episode called Silver Blaze, where the way Sherlock Holmes very intelligently uh, figured out who committed the murder was because the dog didn't bark. Right. And so the dog knew the person. Exactly. And 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 see, it's sometimes the absence of something that is the most important thing, the profound impact of the thing that didn't happen. Okay. And uh and you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So, you know, you're you and your listeners will probably like this one, right? So a lot of people think liberals are out of their mind, which I wouldn't disagree. Um, you know, uh, left Some wing policies, left wing policies are pretty much bankrupt. OK, uh, you know, they, they they don't work. OK, now, you know, I do agree with a lot of the social issues just because I'm a libertarian. I don't think the government should be governing much of anything. You know, I just think we should all be free. And as long as we don't hurt anybody else, you know, do what you want. I don't care. Right. OK, so that's the libertarian idea, which is a different part of the spectrum from right and left. It's and these real estate busts have happened over and over throughout the years. I mean, in Florida, I think there's been 17 of them since they started building here. So isn't it really an indication that we're probably at the peak of the market and that well, uh, something the, needs to happen? Uh, valid question for sure. But it's a, that question needs to be smoked out intensely. And this is the problem with people... And I know your your listeners say stuff like that to you, right? Oh, so here's fine. the problem. Here, here's the problem is that, you know, how do you know where we are in that cycle exactly? You can say, OK, well, it feels like the market is frothy. But the question you never ask is how much more frothy can it go? You know, maybe yeah, we're just at the beginning of that cycle of peak or topping out. You know, um, we don't know. You know, it, it could it could be three to five more years before we hit this alleged peak. But if if the population is increasing and prosperity is increasing and, you know, that's really never happened before. Oh, what I was going to say about Ray Kurzweil is that um, he said that over the last hundred years, average or median income, I can't remember which it was, um, has increased 11 fold in constant dollars over the past hundred years. Now, of course, you and I and most of your listeners are going to say, well, that's only because that's the official index, the, you know, the government quoted mm -hmm. stats on CPI, et cetera. And I'm not going to disagree with that for a minute. OK, because, you know, I agree with that, too. But Jeremy Siegel especially was talking about this, how with growing prosperity through globalization that's lifted over 300 million people out of poverty uh, over the last couple of decades and the uh, rising tide of the middle class around the world, that there is going to be an 
an asset shortage. And of course, the po- just population in general is increasing. And um, I heard an interview with Ray Kurzweil recently. Uh, you know, he's he's the futurist and inventor and uh, uh, singularity guy that's thinks, you know, we're, our life is going to be massively extended in the very near future. With all of this going on, Carrie, it begs the question, where are the assets for all of these people to buy? And, and you know, it's an interesting, most people don't think of this. Most investors never think about this question. And, you know, if I hadn't read that, read that article, you know, back in 2004 or so, I probably wouldn't have thought about it either. But there, there is a looming asset shortage. And I, I guess I'm feeling it too. And if you look at the prices of virtually every asset in the world over the past couple of years, especially since the Trump election. I mean, does it feel like there's a shortage? It sure does to me. Yeah, well, these shortages usually are indications of market peaks, aren't they? Market tops. Maybe. That's that's a valid argument for sure. And they at least they have been in the past. You know, one minute uh, you can't find a house, all right? And the next minute you have the mortgage crisis, the foreclosure crisis. And 